Welcome back. You're watching the Dan Education series on health and diving and we're looking specifically now at chapter 5 on decompression sickness where we look at the contributing factors that may add to decompression stress which may be workload, thermal stress and of course various diving practices flying after diving, fitness, state of hydration, the gas mixtures, carbon dioxide levels, patent for Ramonavale and a number of additional factors. Let's start off with looking at them one by one. Remember that each individual is a unique individual. It is impossible to factor in all those elements that relate to a particular individual on individual dive. And therefore a host of factors may play a role in the cause but also in the outcome of a decompression sickness event. But there are a number of common risk factors that can be outlined and are considered in this particular presentation. Let's start off with workload during the dive. The timing and intensity of exercise during a dive can significantly affect the risk of decompression sickness. Working hard during the descent or bottom phase will increase gas uptake and will add decompression stress after the dive or immediately after the dive. In addition, if there is a heavy lifting or carrying of heavy equipment or straining after a dive, this may encourage bubbles to pass through the lungs or through the heart and cause symptoms. You should always try and keep exercise activity as low as possible during the bottom phase and for the first two to three hours after surfacing from a dive. Any form of exercise puts strain on the joints and this may provoke decompression related bubbles. Keep the dive profiles conservative and consider the estimated metabolic energy requirements. We've spoken about that in previous chapters. Remember that maintaining lower levels of exercise intensity may assist greatly in lowering the amount of inert gas that is absorbed during a dive. Ideally Keep it below 6 mets, which is a comfortable swim without a current. Thermal stress. Thermal stress has long been known to influence decompression risk. The impact is best appreciated by considering two fundamental issues in every dive. The bottom phase, where gas uptake occurs, and the ascent and surface phase, where gas elimination occurs. During the descent and bottom phase of a dive, a relatively warm state results in increased inert gas uptake. This is equivalent to conducting a deeper or a longer dive. On the other hand, if you can maintain a cool or cooler or thermoneutral state during your descent and bottom phase, you will also have a reduction or a predictable uptake of inert gas. This beneficial effect will further be magnified if you exert yourself as little as possible during this phase. During the ascent and stop phase of your dive, a relatively warm state will promote inert gas elimination, thus reducing overall decompression stress. On the other hand, a cool or cold state during the last phase of a dive will reduce inert gas elimination effectively thereby prolonging and possibly increasing decompression stress. The decompression hazard associated with hot water suits which effectively establish a warm condition in both phases of a dive was well established in the North Sea and studied 30 years ago. The impact of thermal stress on decompression was elegantly demonstrated by a recent study conducted by the US Navy in 2007 by Wayne Gerth. 
the controlled conditions of the study cannot directly be correlated with everyday diving practices, but the key message is important and one should remain thoughtful of it. Keeping neutral on your way down, certainly avoiding overheating and warm on your way up, that is approaching a cool warm pattern will reduce the risk of decompression sickness in comparison to being warmer on the way down and cool on the way up, a warm cool pattern. Now let's look at some optimal practices. The difficulty comes in reconciling optimal practices for decompression safety with divers desire and normal practices. It's understandable for divers to want to warm themselves before the start of a dive and in anticipation of getting colder as the dive proceeds. Historically, Divers did this by pouring warm water into their wetsuits or gloves before the dive. Then some divers began to place chemical hot packs in their suits. Modern divers have even become more sophisticated and have greater choices in actively heating their dive garments. The problem though remains the same. Warming the body's periphery enhances circulation and increases the delivery of inert gas, particularly if the heating is applied early in the dive, when inert gas uptake is typically at its highest. Furthermore, both warm water and chemical hot packs lose their effectiveness over time, potentially creating a warm cool pattern shown to generate the greatest risk of decompression sickness. Even active heating garments, which are able to keep the diver warm throughout a dive, involve a somewhat elevated risk. As shown with hot water suits, a warm, warm pattern, while associated with less decompression sickness than a warm, cool pattern, remains more hazardous than a cool, warm pattern. Practically, divers should maintain adequate thermal protection and ensure clear thinking and physical capability. Divers must also keep in mind that post-dive warming can influence decompression risk. Indulging in rapid post-dive warming such as by taking a hot shower or getting into a hot tub decreases the solubility of inert gas and may promote the possibility of developing decompression illness. Fortunately, skin symptoms, which are the most common, resolve relatively quickly and without too much difficulty. Now let's look at post-dive air travel. Modern air travel has made distant dive locations easily accessible. Flying to a destination near sea level before diving engenders virtually no risk, outside the possibility of mild dehydration or impairment of movement during long periods of sitting in an aeroplane. Since flights end with compression, which means they descend, the tissues of plane passengers are actually undersaturated when landing, and the accumulation of inert gas then occurs once they are at sea level. Flying after diving, however, increases the risk of decompression stress because the pressure in the aircraft cabin is lower than that at ground level. Commercial aircraft maintain the capability of about 8,000 feet, which is 2,400 meters, and 0.76 atmospheres. This does not mean that the cabin pressure is always maintained at that level. It may be at a lower level. But a study has found that cabin pressures exceeding 8,000 feet are more likely to cause decompression illness symptoms. We encourage you to watch other parts of the diving series where we talk specifically of flying after diving because it is a whole topic on its own and there are guidelines that should be followed. But in general, after a single dive, a minimum of 12 hours is suggested and after multiple days of diving a minimum of 18 hours is suggested. With more aggressive diving 
more than 18 hours is recommended. There are two further factors of note regarding the DAN UHMS flying after diving guidelines. They apply to flights at altitudes between 2,000 and 8,000 feet, which is 600 to 2,400 meters, and the effect of the flight below 2,000 feet was considered insignificant, and therefore that sort of modest between island travel was insignificant. But when divers traveled on commercial airliners for longer than four hours at altitudes of 8,000 feet and in that order, the chances of developing decompression illness were greater. Now the experimentation or design of experiments that have been done to actually develop the flying after diving guidelines were done under very strictly controlled artificial conditions and may not necessarily be able to account to every conceivable situation with actual diving activity. Next, let's look at medical and physical fitness. It stands to reason that poor fitness is not a good thing when it comes to diving and the risk of decompression illness. But the data is surprisingly limited. It is a sound recommendation to improve fitness, but we cannot quantify the risk of a diver's lack of physical uh, fitness in terms of their actual risk to develop decompression illness. All we recommend is staying in shape. There are two ways in which you can do that, aerobics and strength training. And the CDC 2008 Physical Guidelines for Americans recommends two and a half hours a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise to achieve the health benefits or optimal health benefits and or five hours a week for additional benefits. Similarly, the strengthening exercises should be twice a week for the same duration. While good health and physical fitness will not solve all the problems, it certainly will solve some and minimize the risk. While diving fitness is an important goal to strive for, we also recognize that we age and therefore there is an unavoidable gradual loss of muscle mass and the capacity for exercise. And this should be adopted as we age and we should adjust our diving styles accordingly by diving more conservatively as we age. That's the best strategy that we can recommend at this stage. Maintain strength and aerobic capacity as best you can by swimming, running, cycling or other physical activities that are enjoyable. State of hydration. Dehydration is getting a lot of attention in the lay diving community as a risk factor for decompression sickness, but it's probably slightly exaggerated. Sound hydration is important for general health and certainly for diving. Thermal stress, exertion level and the other factors we listed are actually more relevant than the state of hydration. But if you can, and certainly to the extent that it's possible, maintain normal uh, states of hydration that can be assessed by essentially looking at the color of urine and trying to keep it at the color of water as clear as possible. Concentrated urine becomes yellower and yellower unless you of course taking diuretic or caffeine uh, containing uh, substances or alcohol that increase diuresis. Next, breathing gas mixture. How you decide to mix your gas influences your diving safety. If you decide to dive on nitrox and you use an air profile while diving on nitrox, it may mean that your dive is significantly more conservative. So this is something that can be used to best advantage. This allows you to have a decompression safety buffer when you use nitrox as air and reduces the inert gas uptake during your dive. The critical caveat with nitrox is that its higher oxygen content means that the diver 
breathing nitrox is at risk of developing oxygen toxicity and therefore the depth that to which the diver dives should be according to the nitrox recommendation and these are clearly trained in nitrox uh, training programs and a 1.4 atmosphere partial pressure of oxygen is what is recommended. Next, carbon dioxide level. Elevated levels of carbon dioxide can increase the risk of decompression sickness and lower the threshold for oxygen toxicity. Carbon dioxide is a potent vasodilator which means that it widens blood vessels and increases delivery of blood to the brain which means oxygen levels as well. This means that if CO2 increases the brain may be exposed to a higher PO2 as well as a PCO2 and this may increase the chance of an oxygen related seizure particularly when breathing uh, enriched oxygen mixtures. Next Peyton for Amenavale. Peyton for Amenavale is not going to be dealt with here again. It's dealt with in detail in the series on the heart and diving and we refer you to that section uh, to see how the influence of a flap Patent for Amenavale may influence the risk of decompression illness to a very, very modest extent. There are only certain types of decompression illness that are associated with a PFO, and with about 25% of divers having a PFO, and the low incidence of decompression illness that we see clearly means that PFOs are not a major deal. However, for certain individuals they may be relevant and for those that are identified as being at risk as a result of a PFO may need a medical intervention. So lastly, let's look at some additional factors. There are a host of factors that may contribute to a, an individual's given risk of decompression sickness. Some probably play minor roles and some potentially play important roles that have not yet been fully defined. There is additional risk on a number of areas that is needed. For instance, gender. There doesn't seem to be a significant risk between the male and female gender. Advancing age is sometimes suggested as increasing DCS risk, but again, it is not a predictable pattern that has been rendered to an appreciable or quantifiable risk. With that, we hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Please subscribe to this channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and post your comments, and let's keep the dialogue going and participate in Dan's research programs, which are part of elucidating the relevance, the importance, and of course, trying to quantify the impact of these various risk factors. Until next time, safe diving.